Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Stripping the Dipping. I'm your unusual co-host, F1 Blag. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to have today's guest. I have to pinch myself each week uh, when Georgie gets us these guests. Um, you know, when we had Mario Andretti, when we had Miles Rowe, when we had Jack Bridge the other day. Today, I'm really delighted to be joined for the first time for me on a, a podcast uh, by someone uh, that is in aerobatics. He's a competitive air race pilot. In fact, he was the first American Red Bull air race pilot. So without any further ado, uh, I'd really love to introduce to everybody on the line, Anthony Oshinuga. Anthony, how are you? Welcome to the show. Hey, Mr. Black, I'm well. Thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Hey, I just want to make a clarification. Um, so I'm not a Red Bull pilot. I am an uh -huh. air race pilot, air show pilot, air bag pilot. One of my goals, though, is to become uh -huh. a, um, a sponsored Red Bull athlete, right? So I work in various areas, but I, I, I hope that, you know, Red Bull comes knocking on my door. Yeah, unless there's news that we know about and that you don't know about. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, we're manifesting tonight. We hope nice. uh, awesome. to become a stop to that uh, athlete. Fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit like about yourself. Um, when We always ask this question to our esteemed guests. If you um, are introducing yourself and what you do to someone that doesn't know, who, who uh, is Anthony? What, what do you uh, tell people about yourself? Uh, so simply, I just tell them, hey, I'm, I'm an aviation athlete. I, I work in um, various arenas within the, within the space of aviation, one of which is air shows. So like the stuff you see with the Blue Angels flying, but I'm flying a little plane with, with a propeller doing and over and flips and cartwheels in the air to, uh, to, to um, inspire the crowd from below. I also do air racing and I kind of tell them, hey, it's just basically I'm in an airplane racing 50 feet above the ground with eight other airplanes around me going 100 to 200 miles per hour around pylons and then the last but not least is the competition airbags and that just pretty much keeps me very sharp and precise in my flying it's it's uh, it's comprised of flying various maneuvers as precise and as exact as possible in front of a panel of judges so I, and then once i kind of explain that they kind of they, they're able to start grasping you know their minds around that information and then you know, within minutes they're asking questions because now they kind of understand what's 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 going on. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to hold myself back from asking questions because I want to know how a guy kind of wakes up one day and says, "Do you know what? I'm going to be <laughs> an, an aerobatics pilot." So tell us, like from childhood, was there anything about you as a kid that was indicated that this is where you were going to go? <laughs> You know, life is life is funny, right? You know, if I was look, if I look back, you know, twenty years, twenty or thirty years back when I was a young kid, I would have never thought that I would be in this position that I'm in now. Um, you know, it started with just uh, my father um, being my mom. My mom and my father were born in Lagos, Nigeria, and they moved out to they moved to my father moved to Texas for school, um, and I was born there in Austin, Texas, and my dad had a friend who was a pilot. Uh, my dad wasn't a pilot. He was a, um, so he's an engineer by trade. And so he, his friend told my father to, you know, drive the car on the runway and just park it on the approach end and turn the car around. So I remember it as two, two years old, I'm sitting on my dad's lap and I'm watching this airplane, which I thought at the time was going to hit the car, but it was actually flying right over the car to land on the runway behind us. And the whole afternoon as a two year old boy, I'm watching these airplanes fly over the car and I'm just flabbergasted. I mean, it was, it was, ama it was, it was an amazing experience. And I know the, cl the cliche saying, you know, for youngsters is, you know, youngsters are very impressionable, but this was more than an impression. This was like a, a, a like a lifelong seed that was embedded and planted in my soul. And it was, there was such a great connection there. And I think that's what really spawned and kind of grew everything. And I think my dad being my father, being very intuitive and, and an engineer, he saw, that you know aviation kind of took hold of me so he just nurtured it you know pretty much nurtured it and then, you know from then on i just you know put one foot in front of the other start meeting people start you know understanding more about aviation start getting my hands involved and you know got my private class license and then you know i didn't i wasn't even thinking about aerobatics or rolling the airplane at all i, I didn't that didn't happen until later in my life 
imagine uh, you know a two-year-old probably slightly too young to enter the world of aerobatics just then. But so you you, <laughs> so you were two watching these planes. I, you gave us such a a vivid uh, image. Uh, I can just imagine mm-hmm. that. Um, and so you go through school. Am I right in thinking that you're a mechanical engineer by training as well? Is, did that have something to yes. do with this? Yeah, yeah, I was a mechanical engineer by trade. And the reason why I wasn't an aeronautical or aerospace engineer is because my father mentored me and, and recommended that I get my degree in mechanical engineering. His reason for this was because as a mechanical engineer in that, in that, in that uh, discipline, they teach you not only about the mechanics, but they teach you, they teach you about biomechanics, thermodynamics, uh, they teach you about aer- aerospace, uh, they teach about electrical. I mean, the, the gamut is so broad. So, and the reason why my dad told me to do that is because in in, in case there was some type of adverse situation with the air, airline industry or something like that, where, you, you know, you lost your job as an, a pilot, you can always fall back on your mechanical engineering degree and, and go out there and get a job pretty much anywhere doing anything. And in a way, like as a son of um, someone from Nigeria as well, I can relate to the fatherly advice of like, you know, make sure that your qualification gives you options. <laughs> it's like quite, quite, quite a common story, uh, mm-hmm. but not a common profession to go into. So you you studied mm-hmm. um, in California, you got your mecha- mechanical engineering degree. Was that before or after you got your pilot's license? And how do you go from there? To becoming an aviation athlete as you describe it yeah so um, i was always involved in aviation um you know before you know before i went to college i would you know hang around the airport all the time you know they called me like the air the airport bum because i would be there all the time just watching airplanes fly landing talking to people just getting involved um i grew up we grew up very we were we grew up poor, right? So coming from Nigeria to America, we're, you know, we're, for, I'm, I am the first generation of my family lineage to be living in America. So we we grew up quite poorly. When I look back at, when I look back now and see and kind of recall some of the things that happened. <clears throat> so I didn't have, I, at the time I didn't have money to, to, or my father or my parents didn't have money to put me through aviation school or anything like that. So I had to wait till I was in college until I got a job. And then I started putting myself through uh, aviation you know, curriculums in school while I was getting my degree in engineering. I didn't get my, I didn't get my license till 08, 2008. And then what happened was um, I had a friend or I, I met somebody at the airport and he, they noticed me just from walking around. So he's pushing his biplane out. It was a two seater biplane. It was a Christian Eagle at the time. He's pushing it out. He saw me, he said, Hey, he called me over and I said, Hey, what's up? He said, you want to go for a ride? And I said, Oh yeah, sure. Of course. I would love to go for a ride. So he strapped he strapped on a parachute on me. I didn't think nothing of it. I was like, okay, maybe it's just a safety precautionary reason you gotta wear a parachute. And we get in the airplane, he gives me a briefing, we take off. We're flying in the air now. And we're in the air, it's pretty smooth. Things are loud, things are and things are moving fast because it's a fast airplane. And then he asked me if I wanted to, you know, go through a, a series of airbag maneuvers, which were consisted of a roll, a loop, um, and a hammerhead. And I said, I, I said, sure, absolutely. I didn't I, you know, I didn't know what to expect. So he did a roll, he did a loop, hammerhead, and I was, I was, I was in awe because you know I'm so used to, especially being a, a, almost a ground dweller at that time, experiencing two dimensional space and time where we just in a car you go left, right, back, front, and back. Where in an airplane you can go, you can roll it on axis, on the X Y Z axis, and it's or the X X Y axis, and it's just amazing to me. So we we did that, we did those series of maneuvers, and. On the way back, I asked him. I asked him a question. I said, "Hey, Norm, what we just did was that was that all entirely legal?" He said, "Yes, absolutely." I was like, "What? Oh, how do I sign up? Where do I need to sign up to start doing this?" And that's when it started. Right? He he's the one that got me into it, and I found out it was legal. You could do this legally, and I start. I start. I registered for IAC, which stands for International Aerobatic Club. So I became a, a club member, and I was. I never looked back. I never looked back and I just been doing airbags since then. Um, and, and yeah, I love, I love what I do. And I just, I just wake up being so appreciative to have the ability to do, to do those things. I know most people suffer from like motion sickness or all those things, but I don't. So I just got lucky. 
story because there's so many words you're throwing in there like ground dweller i didn't realize i was a ground dweller but i guess i am right <laughs> <laughs> um and, and the idea that you like you could you could probably tell many stories that at the end say was that all entirely legal um but no right, so right. Tell, tell our listeners what is a hammerhead we know what a roll is i think i think we know what a loop is we can work that one out so what's a hammerhead mm -hmm. So a hammerhead is you it's a maneuver where you are you gain speed let's say you point the airplane down at a 45 degree angle downwards to gain airspeed you need energy and so i usually shoot for 180 miles per hour and once i reach that i pull on the stick to to position the plane so that it's going straight vertical in the air so now you're driving this plane now imagine this plane is, it's 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 flying vertically it's going straight up and right before the airplane wants to, right before it loses all its energy, it falls out of the sky. You do a series of inputs that, that consist of rudder and stick, and the airplane will pivot, will just pivot like motionless towards the ground. And then, you're, and then, and then it starts flying down towards the ground and you pull out. That's pretty much what a hammerhead is. Wow. That was quite vivid. You know, the, I was drawing on a bit of paper, the 45 degree angle 180 miles an hour okay so tell me yep. this right mm -hmm. you, you're going up straight up vertically up with all that speed and your speed mm -hmm. bleeds away how do you yes. judge when it's the right moment to as you say use the rudder and the stick have you ever got that wrong um yeah oh yeah so when i first started doing these things when you first start doing it doing it you, you, you you'll mess up but you know i flew with an instructor so i flew in the, in the airplane with an instructor with me so we would do it together so that it would you know, number one, I wouldn't be starting from scratch and I wouldn't have too many blunders or incorrect inputs at the wrong time. So I, I, I kind of understood when I needed to put the inputs in. So basically it's, it's, a, it's a couple of things that need to happen is that you have to feel your aircraft. Once you get to a level of, of aviation as, a, as an aviator, you almost stop looking at the gauges and you just fly by feeling and sight when you're doing aerobatic stuff. I mean, when you're flying close to the ground, of course you have to you have to look at your airspeed indicator your, and you have to look out look out look at how high you are over the ground. But when you're doing like hammerheads, hammerhead is a maneuver you, you do typically do kind of high. So when you're doing those things, uh, any type of maneuver, I just for me, I just feel the airplane. But there's a couple of indications that we we do. There's like a some people tie like a piece of yarn to uh, a, uh, it's called the eye strut of the of the wing, and when that when that yarn starts to, because when you pull in straight vertical, the yarn you'll see the yarn's it's coming downwards, right? It's it's a straight the air airflow is flowing and pulling this yarn down. Once that airflow starts to dissipate, the yarn starts to wiggle, and that kind of indicates that okay, it's almost time. If it's not time, it's almost time to uh, put the rudder in. Rudder, put, rudder inputs in, in as well as the yoke inputs in to pivot the airplane. So it's a combination of things, but you, typically it's ice. It's just feeling of the airplane. You just, I just feel it. You feel it. In the way you casually said blunder, as if it's kind of a minor mishap if it goes wrong. <laughs> There's a lot of courage yeah. in there. Um, so, so tell us a bit. Like, um, obviously, you were relatively young when you um, sort of went up to the air in the first time with Norm uh, doing these flips and so on. Do you, what physical sort of training or preparation do you need to be an aviation athlete? Well, yeah, you got to be uh, an all encompass athlete. So not only mentally strong, you got to be physically strong and you have to be intellectually strong. I mean, you could, you can go out there and do 15 flights a day and, 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 and literally accomplish nothing. So you have to, you know, sit down and have a goal and, and actually focus on how you're going to achieve those goals. So let's say you're going to go out there and, and do 10 perfect hammerheads. Well, you got to break it down. You got to break it down piece by piece, section by section, input by input um, and to, to master to master any maneuver. Um, and then, um, of course, the gym is very important. So for for aviation athletes or competition or athletes, from my experience, uh, gym is very important. So the it's the core. So abs, your stomach, your abdominal needs to be really strong. Thighs need to be strong. Um, muscle wise, when I say strong, you need to have muscle there so that when you flex and tense up, you can trap the blood in those areas. Um, you you got to have a strong neck too as well. So what happens is when you're flying an, air, an airbag airplane and you're let's say you're pulling ten G's, a G is 
So if, for those who don't know what a G is, a gra G stands for gravitational force, a G. So right now, let's say I weigh 200 pounds. Let's say, let's say I weigh 200 pounds. That's one G. So this, that's the G force that we experience on this earth. Now, when you're in an airplane, you're pulling 10 Gs. That's basically 10 times your body weight. So that's what you'll feel when you're pulling a vertical, like if I'm going from 180 miles per hour straight and level and I want to go vertical, and let's say I go 10 Gs, you're feeling the time it takes you to go from horizontal to vertical, whatever that time, it could be a second, it could be a half a second, it could be two seconds, whatever that is, those seconds, that's the amount of G forces you that's um, from your head down to your toes. So the reason why it's so important to work out and get in the gym and stay strong and fit is because when you pull in those G's, the blood that's sitting in your brain that keeps your brain alive and keeps you thinking coherently, the G's will push that blood out of your brain down to the bottom of your feet. And if that happens, you experience unconsciousness. G-lock is what they call it. So it's, it's G-lock. Um, and that means, and you go unconscious until until those G's dissipate and the blood and the heart pumps that blood back to your head. To prevent that, we've been, there's a couple of maneuvers, techniques we've been taught. And one of which is pretty much for lack of, for lack of better words, it's just pretty much flexing every inch of muscle in your body from your neck down to your chest, down to your stomach, down to your thigh. What that does is for momentarily, it will trap that blood in your brain, in your head and keep you conscious until you've executed the maneuver that you're executing and completed. So yeah, so that's just yeah, one, that, that's, just, that's just one element. So that's the, that's the gym side, that's getting in the gym. Um, mm -hmm. And another thing that I've noticed too about gym, the gym is it's not good to be too cardiovascularly in shape. And it sounds kind of counterintuitive. And let me see if I can explain it to you. So if you take a runner, if you take a guy that runs, all he does is run every day. He's a long distance runner. You put him in an airplane, you pull like four Gs, I'm sure he'll pass out. The reason why is because the blood in his body flows like water. He's so healthy. It flows like water. There's no, there's nothing there to, to slow the, the blood from rushing there. So for me in my workouts, I try not to, I try not to implement too much of cardio. I'll do maybe cardio maybe twice a week because I found out during the season that if, if that blood is, is just coming, is running through me up and down so easily, it's, it's harder for me to keep that blood in my, in my head and keep me conscious compared to um, if I don't do a lot of cardio, if that makes sense. So there's, so there's, the, there's a, the gym aspect to it, there's a the mental focus aspect to it, and there's, a, there's the mental preparation, which I kind of explained to you earlier, just mentally breaking down what you're gonna do piece by piece so that when you go out there, you're actually, you're achieving something in this progress that you can note. Wow. I mean, I'm now going to use that excuse when I don't want to do cardio. I'll just say, well, I'm preparing. <laughs> my, my blood is flowing too well, so I need to do less cardio, please. Uh, and G-Lock is definitely a Top Gun. There's a Top Gun vibe going on. Uh, yes. So, mm -hmm. I mean, incredible. So physical, mental, intellectual, you need the whole package. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading here that in your sort of first rookie season in uh, the U.S. National Aerob uh, Aerobatics Championship, you actually came fourth out of 14, so straight in. Is yeah. that like, is that because, did you take to it like a duck to water? Is there something about you that will be inherently good at flying or like how, how just kind of get into the top four straight away? What's that? Why do you put that? You know what? Yeah, I think that was kind of luck. I was lucky. Um, and then also for the competition aerobatics for that particular session, and that was, there's different, there's different levels to it. So you have like primary, you have uh, sport, you have primary sportsman, intermediate, advanced, and unlimited. Those are the classes. So when I first started this whole journey, I started, you know, of, of course I started with the primary because primary, I'm just starting out. I have very little experience um, in, in compared to the unlimited pilots. So the pilots that were in my car category were in the same boat. Um, I just got training. I just went to train. I went. I, I got a lot of training from a guy named Michael Church out of Sunrise Aviation in Orange County, California. Um, he had some planes there, and I, he trained me. And he's he's a really good coach. Um, I just took those took that preparation that I did with him, and I just took it to Texas when I did the competition, and I just got lucky and I got fourth. Um, of course, I was shooting for top three, but you know I'll settle for I'll settle for fourth place. Michael Church um but then the next year yeah. you got you did get the top three you were second um and was that in yeah. the same uh primary tier or had you moved up or how, like, what were you up to in that year 
Yeah. So remember, I, I fly. So I operate. And this is I operate in three different types of flying. So the first one you just aforementioned when I got fourth was the USA Aerobatic Championships. This one right now you're talking about second place. This is was the um, the National Reno Air Races. So this is the air race. So this is my rookie. This is my rookie season. Never raced a plane before. I got in there. I got second place. Um, and that was just. I think that was just. I, I don't know. I took well to it. I, it was it was natural. It felt like I was home almost, right? I wasn't scared that there was a plane two feet from my wingtip as we're going around a pylon 50 feet because I had to trust these guys that they know what they're doing. Um, you know, you have to get the formation flying um, under your belt and some other things before you can even get invited to come race. That's right. So the aerobatics is, um, I guess, not, you know, try to compare it to something. Is it like gymnastics where they're checking you know, the quality of your maneuvers, whereas in the race, you're literally just trying to get from A to B around the course faster than the other person. Is that right? Yeah, precisely. Yeah, precisely. There's a panel of judges for the competition aerobatics that sit and watch you uh, on the quality of and precision and quality of your maneuvers, whereas racing is just you're trying to beat the guy. You're trying to get in first place and beat the guy ahead of you, but you just try to do it safely. I mean, that, the safely bit, yeah, feels like I would put that in capitals uh, if I was writing that down. <laughs> so, because we, we, we talk a lot about Formula One on this podcast, and I think, you know, mm. so I've been watching that for a few decades. And my sense is that those drivers have to have a lot of respect for one another when they're on the track. But surely, when you're in the air, as you say, um, you really have to trust the other person um, to, I guess, is it is it separate space technically, or is it about like, how do you not crash it's, into each other? What are the rules? Yeah, the rule is don't crash into somebody. <laughs> That's the rule. Don't crash into somebody. Think of it like bicycle racing. Like, you know how the bicycles, they're like the long distance bike, road bikes, uh, bicycles that have the race and they're, they're, they're close to each other, but they don't hit each other. And, and it's remarkable. So we were talking about the respect that uh, your fellow pilots need in the air to avoid um, any sort of collision and, and how that is perhaps even more intense than in Formula One. Um, have you ever seen any sort of horror stories or near misses um, when you've been at competitions? Uh, for the air races? Yeah, for the air yeah. races, I've been, I've been lucky enough not to witness anything in real life, you know, or, or there while, while I was there and or in the air. So, but yeah, we have great respect for one another. It does get, I mean, we're all competitive, right? We all want to win. So there's, sometimes there's, there's a, sometimes there's a, like, a, there's a, um, there's close calls, but it's not, it's, it's not that bad. It's not like that close where it's like a foot away from hitting somebody. It might be like maybe 10 feet. And then we have officials on the ground. So you can get, you can get suspended or you can get like uh, pretty much kicked out of um, the racing organization. If you do, if you're, re if you're a reckless pilot, but again, this is invitation only. So, you know, the guys are really good and respectful. So, um, why don't we talk a bit about how you, um, get to the position where you can compete in, uh, these competitions, because presumably the maintenance of the plane, the upkeep, the entry fees, presumably it all costs money. So is there a business element to this? How do, how do you get yeah. to that position? Yeah, there's definitely a business element to this. I think you, you got to treat this like a business. Some people treat it like a hobby, and I think that's why they get burned out so soon. They don't have the infrastructure that, you know, in place to kind of um, see them out or, or have that longevity. So what I did was um, starting out, I knew I wanted to get involved heavy in aviation um, and, not, and not, have, not be too financially burdened with the expenses. So I, I created a business called Air Oshi or Air Oshinugo. Um, and basically um, what, what, it, what the business is about is we give aerial scenic tours, um, aerial scenic tours over the wineries, like 500 feet and give them tours of the vineyards. The vineyards has over a hundred wineries there. So we give them a tour, we land, we partner with a car service and they, the clients get picked up by the car service and take them on a wine tasting tour where they're tasting wine all day. And so the way the way I thought about this was, okay, what's what's the top three things in in the world that sell a lot? And one of the things was like alcohol, no one's cigarettes and all the stuff. But, but I thought that wine was perfect because wine brings a, a different type of clientele. Everyone likes wine, um, and everyone likes to have a good time. But nobody was doing it. Nobody was doing it with aviation. Nobody had like come get in this airplane a small airplane, so let me fly you over the vineyards and then land and then actually go wine tasting at these vineyards that you just flew over all day. 
So I put this business plan together and did random numbers and, you know, did, you know, kind of projections and stuff like that. And, and it seemed like it worked and it's been working. So, and that, and I used those, I used that, those funds to kind of pay for, you know, help me pay for my first aerobatic plane, help me to, you know, afford the gas expenses, oil expenses, maintenance expenses on these airplanes, re registration fees to get in these events and whatnot. And then, um, yeah, and then I just got lucky too along the way where I just, I was able to, to get sponsorships from organizations who saw what I was doing and wanted to be a part of what I was doing. Make it sound, I'm sure, much easier than it than it was. Um, and this is a fantastic yeah. idea. So flying over the vineyard. Um, here's my question to you, because you talked about a certain kind of clientele in, in quotations. Do you fly them back after a day full of drinking? Are they a bit louder and more vociferous then? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, you know, it's funny you said it. Yeah, my, my very first, like, couple, few months of doing this, that's that's where you experience the trials trials and errors, right? You 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 know you kind of figure out okay what's working, what's not working, and definitely what what wasn't working was you know after they do if they were to go wine tasting for the whole day and they come jump in the airplane and go fly that wouldn't work because either they would get yeah either they're they're you know because they're they're excited they're loud they're 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 full of wine they they're sometimes uncontrollable and and I get it just have fun but you know when you're in an airplane you need to kind of a little bit quite enough to where you can contact and communicate with other airplanes that are in the vicinity flying through or away or whatever have you, right? And then, you know, if you drink too much wine, you know, you can, you can then I have to, you know, have a lot of barf bags in the back because, you know, they might want to, you know, throw up. So, you know, I, so I learned that early on. So what I do now is just, you know, what they, what these clients that come up, they'll get a hotel in the area at, in, in wine country that they'll get, then they'll get a car service that drives them from the wine country to the airport, which is only five miles away. We'll fly them up, do our thing, land, and then the car server gets them and takes them wine tasting. And then they can go wine taste all day, have dinner. Sometimes we'll get special requests where they want to come out and, you know, do, you know, it's an sunset flight or they want to, you know, sunrise flight. We, we accommodate to those people too because, um, you know, those are special occasions, right? And usually they're not, you know, if there's an anniversary, it's they're not, and they want a sunset flight, they're not too liberated where they, they, they're acting uncontrollably in the airplane. <laughs> yeah, trial and error, good phrase. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, yeah, the cleaning bills have gone down in, uh, in Air Oshi, so that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I, I'm reading here as well because like there's a theme and you talked about being two and seeing the planes for the first time. Um, you know, you've got, done it for your passion and hobby. You've got a business that's about flying. You've got qualified in mechanical engineering. But during um, the COVID pandemic in 2020, you also did your bit using your plane and, and your skills to support people in that time. Can you tell our listeners a bit more about what you did? Yeah, so that was, um, yeah, that was, that was, a, that was an interesting time. Um, um, during COVID with, with what we had going on. So what, essentially during COVID, everybody was scared um, about just the things that were happening, the pandemic, people were dying. I mean, it, it was, it was quite, it was quite frightening. Right. And um, I thought that this was be, this would be a good time um, to do something to kind of heighten the spirits, lift the spirits of the community, you know, nat nationally and maybe glo globally, whoever, you know, uh, caught, you know, caught what we were doing. Um, so we did a campaign with Epic Fuels and Signature Aviation. Sign Signature Aviation is probably one of the largest FBOs in the world. And basically, an FBO is pretty much just like a, think of it like when you check into your hotel and you, and you go talk to a concierge. The concierge gives you everything. You get, you can, you know, they have valet service for your car. They'll, they'll have your car filled up when you're ready to go. They have a place for you to stay if you need it for short term. I mean, to pretty much take care of you. Um, so we um, uh, we did a tour around North America, which consisted of, and I and correct, I might be wrong on the the, the number, the exact number, but it was it was profound. But basically, we flew, I believe, six thousand miles in a Pitts S one S, and a Pitts is a single seater uh, airbag biplane, um, and we stopped at over like forty four locations, and we did it in eighteen days, and each location we stopped at. 
we gave gifts to the service providers there because the service providers pretty much when private jets land at their FBOs, they have to be in direct contact with those people that come at the jet, whether it's the family members. And there's there's risk there because you know, you never know, you can, you can contract COVID, especially since it was earlier on and people didn't know what was going on. So we gave them, we gave those those supporters there, you know, we flew in and gave them, you know, gave them uh, a mask, we gave them hand sanitizers, a, a gift mug, and just appreciation, you know, to say, hey, thank you very much for being here and and throughout this this situation and and caring for the clients that are flying in and helping them out during this pandemic. Um, so we did that, you know, we flew, we did that at 40, 44 different locations. So we started in San Diego. Worked our way around North, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Atlanta. You know, we went up North Carolina, Pittsburgh. We went, we went around the whole, the whole nation, and, and did this. It's uh, extremely sort of generous, and, and you mentioned um, it was in association with Epic Fuels. Are they um, a sponsor of yours in your com competitive side as well? Yeah, they they were. They were they were my sponsors for the last you know, five to six years, but then they uh, were bought out by Signature Aviation. And then Signature was bought out by, I think, another company named Blackstone. So our partnership is no longer there. I'm not sponsored by Epic Fuels or Signature anymore because they're under different ownership and they have a different direction they want like to go. I hope that maybe in the near future, you know, they will come back or maybe somebody else will come back and, and help you know, sponsor me in that fashion. Well, you know, we, we were manifesting so Red Bull, perhaps, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but no, awesome. um, a huge impact that you were able to have um, during, you know, it's it's easy to forget how uncertain and scary those times were. So um, oh, yeah. huge, huge uh, props mm -hmm. to you for that. Thank you. Um, so in, an, in a kind of slightly awkward segue, because we like to ask um, sort of fun questions as well. Um, okay. We, we, we've talked a lot about flying and, of course, um, we've talked about, you know, you give people experiences over wineries. Um, I think we saw around the Austin Grand Prix a good few weeks ago now that Lewis Hamilton did some promo work with IWC, the watch company, in a stunt plane. Um, I wondered, on, is stunt um, flying, I don't know if that's the right word, anything that you've done or that you'd be interested in doing in the future? Um. So I, I, but I did something, I did, I don't know if you call it stunt. Yeah, we usually, I, I don't like saying stunt because honestly the, the definition of a stunt is a maneuver that, that, that will be performed that has, that does not have a certain outcome, right? You don't know, it may oh, work, yeah. it may not. You just don't know, right? So, but people, but people, the general public, does, they don't know that. They say stunt because, I mean, that's just the blanket term we, that people use, but we, I like to use, aerobatic pilots, right? I like to use an aerobatic pilot because we do aerobatics. I, the, the things that I'm doing in the air may look like a stunt to you, but I've trained tirelessly hours and hours to perfect it. So it's no longer, it no longer becomes a stunt. It becomes a figure that I fly in the air or an aerobatic maneuver that I fly in the air. So, but to answer your question, would I be interested in uh, doing aerobatics or quote unquote stunts? Yes. Uh, I did something in 2019 with the Diesel Brothers where they had the Monster Jam truck, which weighed 12 tons, and they jumped it in the air on live TV, and I flew my airplane right underneath it. And that was, you know, that was, we practiced that over and over again, but to the public, they might have thought that was a stunt. But definitely, yeah, I'm open to, you know, things like that. I mean, things that has never been done before, just as long as we can execute it safely. I mean, you said all the right things for uh, for future insurers when celebrities come along and, uh, you know, it's not left to chance. So so on yeah. that basis, right, that was all a setup for the next question, right? So you have the option to do not a stunt flight, obviously, but some kind of demonstration um, using your aerobatic skills. Um, and on the first mm -hmm. run, you need to take a Formula One driver. On the second run, you need to take any athlete from any sport. And on the third run, it could be any celebrity. So who would be, you know, your pick for those three? Could be a motor, first one, motor racing driver, second one, an athlete, third one, a celebrity. Any, any people you'd yeah, love so to take? Yeah, so I definitely, I, I definitely would love to take Lewis Hamilton. He's been, you know, I've been watching his career. You know, I got late into watching F1s, right? I wasn't really, didn't really know too much about it until my friends start watching it and I start watching it like maybe eight years ago or something like that. And that's when I noticed Lewis Hamilton. And what he's done in the industry and his career and just like how he how he moves and operates. I mean, I would love to um, 
you know, I would love to take him up for a fight. And and the thing is, I'm not like a groupie or a fan. I mean, I'm a fan of his, but I'm not like a groupie. I, I would sit down here and have a regular conversation with him and just kind of get to know, actually get some tips because he seems like he's very, very wise in a lot of things that he does. And I know he has a lot of stories, but I would love to take him up. I would love to take him up. Um, um, and then so for the, I think you said for an athlete, a celebrity, and what was the last one? Yeah, well, the Formula One driver, tick, complete, Formula. athlete, and then okay. a celebrity, yeah. Now an athlete, uh, hmm, an athlete that I would like to take up. Let's see, any athlete, right? Any, because there's a lot of athletes out there. Yeah, any I athlete, mean, any discipline? Yeah, I've given you a big, mm -hmm. a big range of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. I, I would probably would love to take a uh, Lindsey Vaughn. Okay. Because she has one. that extreme element to her with the winter sports. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. She, yep. I like to take her up, uh, pick her brain too. She seems, uh, she's. I mean, she's a monstrous athlete, right? She, when she was an athlete, she was, she was dominating, and you know, I love that. I love that attitude. I love her. I love, I love her charisma. I love how she, you know, also how she moves and stuff. Now, for a celebrity, who I like to take up for a celebrity, I would like, I would love to take up Michael Jordan. I don't think he will ever get in an airplane with me, but Michael Jordan would be somebody I would love to take up. Does he not like flying or something? I'm sure he'd get up in an airplane with you. Go I, on. I, I, I mean, yeah, I want to assume that he loves flying. I mean, Air Air Jordan is his yeah. hashtag. He loves to fly an airplane, <laughs> so you know. So I, I love, to, I would love to take him up, um, and also just talk to him, pick his brain. I think anything is possible out there. I think, you know, like you said, put it in the air, put it, put it in the universe and things can happen. And maybe one day they'll listen to this podcast. And, that, and that's a perfect segue because, um, you know, what we try and pick our brains of the, of all of the um, guests we have on the show is about their kind of approach mentally to life or any life lessons that they have, because we tend to talk to a range of, you know, extraordinary people. You've done something that, you know, naught point dot, 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 you know, naught, percent of the global population will like, ever do. Um, so have you got any general techniques, uh, general thoughts, your approach to life, your mental attitude, anything that you think you could, um, you know, advice you could give to people out there? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's a lot. Life, life is definitely, life is not easy. I mean, I think everyone in life has, has definitely experienced some, some trials and tribulations or some struggles and some hardships and whatnot. I think that, you know, it's easier said than done, but I think we just got to realize we're, we're in life. We're, 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 we've been dealt these cards and we just got to play the cards accordingly. I, things, things will get tough. And I think when things get tough, I think that's when you, sh you should realize that a change is coming. And I think that you should start experimenting with other ways of operating in life um, to have an opportunity, to have new opportunities that may change your life down the road. That's what I've kind of realized. Um, and I think it's also important to have really good people around you, really good mentors, people that maybe perhaps are doing things that you want to do or you are, you you aspire to do because they'll have the answers. Um, there's always going to be people in your way that's going to tell you you can't do it. I mean, I've heard it millions of times. I mean, and I just keep going. I, and you just got to you have to build that mental fortitude, that mental toughness, because there will be people in your life that's going to tell you no. They're like, nah. And the reason why they're telling you no is because their scope of vision is smaller than yours. So they don't think it's possible. Uh, where well, your scope of vision may be larger. And that's why you're doing the impossible. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of tidbits of life lessons that I've noticed. But uh, I, would, I would leave you know the listeners with just, you know if you have a goal in your life, it, it, even if, if it's small or little, but hopefully it's bigger than most, just go at it full force, put all your soul and your energy into it, and eventually something will happen. It has to. Absolutely. I mean, something that I observed about you um, when you told one of your stories earlier is you said you were hanging around an airfield and someone said, oh, do you want to just come on this plane? And I wrote down, you said, sure, absolutely. So being open to opportunities out of the blue um, yes. feels like something you do, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, 100%. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of opportunities that, uh, yeah, you know, there's a couple of opportunities where I recently said yes to, where I know for sure 10 years ago I would have said absolutely not. But then again, you just got to look at it, man. Life is bringing something to the table. It might bring, it might bring you something worthwhile. You never, you never know. You got to explore it. 
You've got to explore it, absolutely. Um, so we have two questions before we wrap up. The first one, which is um, important, I want to hear about it. Is there um, any project you're working on or is there something we can see you competitively in soon? What, what's the future holding for Anthony Oshinuga? Yeah, so I'm, I got a couple of things up my belt. So this this year, unfortunately, was a very tough year for me for Air, the Air Oshi team. So my my airplane, the Red Pits, we during uh, during training in March of this year for an air show, we're doing an air show evaluation. I, I flew the airplane really hard and I, and I kind of broke the wings. Right, I cracked four four spars of the wing, and so that cost thousands and thousands of dollars that which i wasn't prepared for i didn't budget for so we pretty much had a i had to sit out the year from march to september and in september when i got the airplane ready um i wanted to go my whole goal was to go to the usa national airbag championships in um in kansas this year and place top i wanted to place top 10 to make the usa team so that Next year is the World Aerobatic Championships, where the best pilots in the world fly in to Las Vegas and compete for the gold. So because my airplane was down for the whole year and I got it up in September 20, 22nd and the USA National Aerobatic Championships was October 2nd, leaving me roughly a week and a half. I, I trained for a week and then I had to take it the, the next five days to just fly my airplane to the site location. And I didn't place top 10, I placed in the you know, bottom of the pack. And I, again, this is part of life, right? This is life lessons. You know, sometimes you, you have to fail to get better or to do better. But, you know, there's a lot of things that happen earlier in the year, which I'm not using it as an excuse, but kind of, it kind of, it, it, it definitely hurt me because now that I didn't make the team. So now to answer your question, what, what's the plans for next year? So I think the plans for next year, because I'm not on the USA team, but because my parents are from Nigeria and I hold dual citizenship, I think I want to go to I'm going to go to Vegas and represent Nigeria on the world scale and compete like that. And I think that's going to say a lot to it's it's going to be it's going to be a big statement because I think it's going to especially from the for the Nigerian kids in Nigeria to see a, a you know another fellow African holding their flag and competing against the world. It's going to be it's a bit it's 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 kind of like man it's almost sentimental it's like inspirational it almost makes you want to cry because it's like wow because that has never happened before and and it's just life is just leading me down that path i didn't choose that i wanted to fly for usa but hey i things held me back for reasons unbeknownst to me and i'm just gonna follow the path life is giving me right now and right now life is saying hey you want to be there here's the way you can get there fly under the nigeria flag and go kick some butt so that's what i'm going to be preparing for and training for for next year um um yeah that's pretty much that's gonna be my my main focus i'm gonna be you know working some other things with other sponsors and other companies that are knocking on my door which i can't really talk about right now but uh my main focus is going to be going to vegas next year and, and um doing something doing something well there's a there's a lot to reflect on there you're the king of marketing because now i'm really intrigued about those sponsors so <laughs> when you can tell us you've got to tell us um absolutely and, but you're also the king of understatement you and I kind of broke the wings. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a break. But... You know, well, so, so, so black. The thing is, though. So I'm like again. I, I'm like I, I've started from. I started in this in this aviation uh, story of mine, coming from a you know poor background. So the plane that I have is 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 not is not equivalent in terms of performance as my competitors. My competitors are flying half a million dollar airplanes half a million dollar airplane. My airplane was about maybe 60K, right? So I am, I am, I'm pushing this airplane. Every time I get in this airplane, I'm pushing it to its limits every single time. The airplane's not pushing me to my limits. I'm pushing it to its limits. Now, if I had a half a million dollar airplane, if I had a big sponsor who got me a million dollar airplane, that million dollar airplane would definitely be pushing me to my limits. So it's, it's a thing where you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, place top three, top 10 against these great pilots with great machines. And for me to be able to even come close to them is hopefully speaking to um, maybe aspiring sponsors out there to, you know, to help further my journey along or, or even kids are saying like, you know, that thing is impossible because I'm, I'm trying to do the impossible, not because I want to, because but because i have to i want I, you know I want, winning is like it's an absolute must you know because i'm really passionate about what i do 
I love that. Not because I want to, but because I have to. And um, yeah, that difference, 60K to half a million, that's sort of, you know, 12% to do the quick maths. <laughs> that's huge. So um, I really yes, hope, it. you know, I, I'm, I'm changing my allegiance. I'm team Nigeria. I want to follow this in Las Vegas. <laughs> I can't wait to see how you do. And I Thank hope you. between now and then the sponsorship takes you to a new level. I appreciate it. So before you go, we ask all of our guests this very, very serious question. You can tell that maybe it's not going to be that serious. Okay. So um, to set it up, I imagine you've probably got to stay quite light when you're a pilot, but everybody loves pizza, right? You like pizza? Love pizza. Pepperoni, oh. double. Ah, boom. Okay. You, we, I think pepperoni is the one everybody uh, with good taste loves it. However, there is a, mm -hmm. there is a very important polemic question we ask all our uh, and then we, we seek your reaction, which is pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to say absolutely yes, the way he said absolutely. <laughs> no, no. The pineapple has literally just walked off the pizza and left. He shut the door behind him. He knows where yeah. he's not welcome. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, no pineapple. No, I mean... Nah, the pineapples are good by themselves, or on like I see a on a see a bowl, I see a bowl or something like that. But mm. I don't know pizza. I think that's a clear and decisive answer uh, to the key <laughs> question, um, Anthony. It's been a real pleasure. It's been so fantastic to have you on the show. Um, where can where can our listeners find you? Uh, what are your tags online? Yeah, Black, they can find me on, on Instagram at Anthony Oshinuga, O-S-H-I-N-U-G-A is the last name, and the Anthony is A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. Uh, pretty much all my handles, you can find me through that. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we don't have a TikTok yet. We'll get that. And then YouTube as well. So next year is going to be a bigger a big year for us. We're going to be really hitting the social media platform really, really hard. I've been really busy this year, so I haven't been able to post a lot. But uh, we have some really cool things coming along. We have some really cool projects coming. Oof. God, tantalizing. Okay, well, um, I'm now convincing my wife that we need to go on a wine tour in Southern California, followed by the World <laughs> Series at Las Vegas. Um, I wish you every yeah. success. Um, and I will be rooting for you and Team Nigeria at the World Championships uh, next year. Um, so without further ado, it's been a great pleasure to have you on Stripping the Dipping. Um, I hope that everybody that's listened uprates this episode, but also goes and follows Anthony on his fantastic journey. It's going to be great to see how he gets on here. And in the meantime, I've been your host, F1 Blag. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>